which is nothing more than converting our grid from analog to digital. Yet, I mean, it's kind of an irony that we provide electricity to a digital world, yet we're an analog system. But I think that what's critical here is that as we work together, we, we will find a way to make it work. And I will tell you, when you look at the turnover in the automobiles in the US, and you look at the generation fleet we have today, we can have tens of millions of new electric vehicles used in this country without having to purchase to build additional generation because the way our generation fleet is built is built to meet the peak and being able to charge in the off-peak periods we have a lot of electricity to be used for that so it's not going to result in greater building uh, at least for the first 10 million plus cars but maybe after that it will but in every event it'll be cheaper and I think the Chinese see that it will mean economic security and not dependent on oil. The Chinese believe that strongly also. But it also will lead to a better environment. And they're strongly, and you see this emerging in virtually every company that I work with, a commitment to make sure that their products and services make sense from the impact on the environment. Great. Thank you. Um, do we have questions from the audience? And also, do either any of you have questions for each other? Well, I, I think the, I, I thought the uh, issue of the electric car is, is, is a fascinating issue because I, while, I mean, assuming that we can, in a, few, in a short period of time, translate all the cars in the United States to electricity, uh, I'm not sure that that as a model for the globalization around the world is, is, is desirable. And that we'll still have a, uh, a, a non-dense urban uh, uh, fabric. I don't think that'll be good for, for us. And, I don't, and it certainly, I don't think it'll be good for China to have a, a cities with, with, with physical footprints as a result of automobiles. Uh, uh, even if they're electric, electrical and even if they're from renewable sources. But, but I would say, first of all, we, I've been taught you have to deal with the world as it is today. And we deal with the world today where the auto is really kind of a, the car is really a key part of our economy. Right. And so that's the reality that we live with today. And yes, over time, I believe moving into cities with greater density is where we're going in the long term. But in the short term, I mean, when I look at the amount of emissions of CO2 in the world, we need to do this on a more rapid pace. Um, and, and in China and in the US, I see a situation where you have charging stations in major cities where people have the ability to really sign up and go and use a car when they want to use it on a weekend and then put the e-car back into the charging station and take the bus home or the train home or wherever. I see that as happening within cities that give people a, even a better lifestyle in the sense of having access to cars as well as living within the city. So I see that hybrid evolving. Jeffrey, did you want to say something? I was just going to say that uh, this issue of the automobile obviously is a very central issue for China's urban development also because now, I may be out of date, but I think the estimate is about 100 million vehicles in China compared to uh, for uh, uh, personal use automobiles in the United States, about 250 million. So that if China reached the U.S. density per person, it would be about a billion. Uh, automobiles in China, even a little bit more. And the world couldn't take it, and Chinese uh, traffic couldn't take it. Uh, so uh, the design of uh, China's cities around uh, what use of automobiles is going to be a pretty fundamental question. On the electric vehicle, the possibility is that it's not only electrified, but a very different kind of vehicle as well. One thing that we're uh, looking towards uh, is a, uh, uh, a kind of product that was on display at the Shanghai Exposition uh, this year in the GM Pavilion, actually, which was a very small electric vehicle. Uh, and 
with GM and others uh, were looking to uh, actually prototype this. This would be a self-driving, autonomous, internet-connected, vehicle-to-vehicle, future uh, vehicle, which would be a, about uh, one-fifth the size and weight. So it would be lightweight, uh, urban design, not for uh, intercity transport, which I think in China's case is really going to be rail, if that's the, the design but a much different kind of personal mobility experience uh, in the cities as well. I just raise it because this set of issues is so fascinating, but it's really going to redefine uh, the, the urban space also, and figuring out what's possible, what's appropriate, I think will be one of the most interesting questions. Uh, and China will be one of the places, uh, obviously, that it pioneers all of this. And Lu Mai, do you see in the advice you're giving cities, what do you think about the, the transit car mix? Uh, the city government in China really want to have an automobile industry mm -hmm. to settle there. Uh, it's generated GDP and uh, revenue, like uh, Beijing. To, this morning, we, we heard that uh, Beijing uh, automobile. Yeah. That's on one side, but now they suffered from a traffic jam, from a, the a citizen complaint. So they have to make a balance. Now they try to control. Uh, that's for Beijing government. It's always like this, uh, want to make a balance. But public transportation is uh, most important uh, for China. I think all those uh, mayors understand. We need to solve those uh, problems uh, as, as soon as possible. For example, uh, China now produces uh, more cement uh, than many other countries. Uh, how much? Uh, now it's uh, 1.7 uh, billion ton uh, by 2020. And now it's uh, 1.4 billion uh, ton uh, every year we produce uh, Siemens. And uh, still, uh, by 2020, we will produce uh, uh, about uh, uh, 7 million, uh, 700 million ton. So uh, the people have a right to live in the city. I, I should uh, uh, say that clearly. Uh, illegal migrants in China, there are. Uh, we have uh, some uh, people illegally come to China uh, from either Africa or from uh, Korea. But domestically, everybody has a right uh, constitutionally. So it's not uh, illegal migrants. It's uh, totally free to, to move to. But the, the issue is the public service. Now the people want to have a better house, larger. Uh, even larger like United States. So how to solve these problems? How to, uh, how do I say? It, it's a big issue. Well, U.S. China can work together to uh, working on the coal industry uh, 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 as uh, energy, can solve the problem of uh, the transportation, but also uh, housing and the several, several. So uh, this is an urgent issue. So I showed you the picture of um, Detroit today as a, as a warning of what happens when you let the auto industry overtake uh, <laughs> planning of a city. <laughs> My hometown. Uh. Um, actually, uh, Jeffrey, a question said, um, uh, I'd like to encourage Jeffrey to sing a different tone on the culture of pursuing growth, growth at any cost. So do you have more to say about that? that I would sing a different tune? Excuse me, I misread it. I want to thank you for singing a different tone. Oh, oh yeah. No, I, I've never uh, advocated growth at any cost. Right. Yeah. And, and so as you look at, at the world's um, growth, how do we balance this? Because what we're continually hearing is we want more prosperity, we want middle, more middle class. Lumai is saying uh, we need to find $4 trillion for infrastructure and for services and to balance those two. And, and implicit in that is growth. And yet, also implicit in growth is the absolute destruction of the earth that sustains us. Well, I, I think we've learned uh, one thing, which is that what we measure as uh, growth, which is typically the gross national product per person changing over time, 
is not necessarily correlated with what we want out of life, uh, especially after a certain level of development has been reached. And the paradox in the United States, which has a name, it's called the Easterland Paradox, after a professor at Penn uh, found it, is that during the last 50 years, while the US GNP per person soared, the reported self, self-reported level of happiness remained unchanged. And clearly, we experienced some very serious, uh, very, very serious deficits from uh, this kind of change in terms of environment, obesity epidemic, many things that occurred uh, that uh, show that we're not necessarily measuring right what we really want. Now, for very poor countries where I work, growth is usually correlated with an improvement of living standards. But for rich countries, after a point, it might not be correlated with an improvement of living standards. Then things that we don't measure in GNP can be a lot more important. And uh, one of my favorite countries in the world is Bhutan, uh, Himalayan uh, paradise, by the way, uh, where uh, they have a concept called gross national happiness. Uh, which is uh, taking uh, Buddhism into modern economy uh, terms. And uh, I'm hosting a conference with the Prime Minister of Bhutan this summer on gross national happiness, where we're having uh, representatives from China, from India, from Greece, from other places talk about the concept of happiness from many perspectives, from Confucian perspective, from Hindu perspective, from Buddhist perspective, and so on. And I'm very interested to see whether there will be over time a way to measure what counts in a, in a lot more meaningful way. But this is, I like the concept of harmonious society and I like the concept of uh, what uh, some of Confucian teaching uh, offers on this as well. We can't go on using GNP per capita as if this is really our endpoint metric. We have to be a lot more subtle and self-aware than that. But Jonathan, I'd make an observation that our challenge is sustainable growth throughout the world. And that's the challenge for purpose-driven capitalism in the future, the ability to really do that. And part of that is achieving, as you heard the luncheon, um, as the CEO of Citicorp said, look at the number of new jobs that we need to create in the world. And I think part of happiness is having a job. Mm -hmm. And so I would say sustainability, sustainable growth that leads to full employment is really something that we ought to try to tack toward, not just in the US, but also in China. And I think that is, would be a meaningful achievement if we could do that. Because I've come to believe that talent is universal, but opportunity is not. And I think that is what is in front of us that we must do. Yes. I also want to say something about the measurement. Uh, in China, we, we also learn uh, from uh, the work uh, uh, the UN did and uh, France uh, did. Uh, we, we try to have our well-being index. We measure that. Uh, we work with uh, People's Congress uh, to do the ex experience, experiment. We collect uh, 50,000 of uh, the, the people's uh, response uh, to do the survey uh, among them. So the result is the people come from a poor province has a higher satisfaction. The rich coast area is uh, lower than that. Uh, the people in that the lower education has a higher satisfaction. And uh, the, another issue is the uh, old generation has a very high satisfaction. So it's come from, it's come to this group. They're young, they want to find a better job. Uh, they are educated not the uh, very high, high school, uh, college educated. This group is uh, not very, very happy. So this is the issue. Uh, we cannot teach them, tell them, 
you should be satisfied so with this life. Ride bicycle, find a low payment job, and no, they don't want. They want to live in as an American. <laughs> <laughs> Who aren't very happy. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> Welcome to New York. <laughs> Yes, they want to migrate. <laughs> so uh, we're so going to bring this panel to a close, but we've actually come to, I think, a really important place, which is that the goal really, I love this phrase of purpose-driven uh, um, purpose capitalism and purpose-driven society. And I think if the purpose really is about happiness, it's not about GDP, it's not about quantity, and it is only through the pursuit of happiness, of deep happiness, not, not joyful, I mean joyful is part of deep, but of deep happiness and satisfaction that we'll, we'll, we're going to find the intersection of the solution to all these issues. So I thank you all for your wisdom, and thank you all for your attention. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know you were getting to sustainable happiness. <laughs>